the latest official count of over 99.8% of the ballots in Peru's presidential elections shows progressive candidate Pedro Castillo, ahead of the right-winger Keiko Fujimori with 50.2% of the votes, a difference of about 71,800 preferences. In Europe, several organizations rejected a draft resolution introduced by a group of European members of Parliament accusing Cuba of violating human rights. Former Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan met the president of the new Malian transitional government in Bamako to mediate a transition towards elections in the country. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South. I'm Gladys Quesada. And now we begin. In Peru, Pedro Castillo is keeping the lead in the presidential runoff polls held last Sunday. According to the latest figures released early morning Wednesday by Peru's electoral body, AMPE. The official count of almost 100% of the vote suggests he has beaten far right winger Keiko Fujimori by a narrow margin of a 0.4 percentage. The difference between Castillo and Fujimori amounts to 71,800 preferences. On Tuesday evening, Castillo briefly addressed hundreds of followers gathering on a permanent basis in front of his Peru Libre Party headquarters in Lima, awaiting final results. Meanwhile, the extreme right candidate Keiko Fujimori continued denouncing episodes of fraud and hinting she might demand a repeat of the polls. Fujimori, the daughter of former dictator Alberto Fujimori, is facing penal charges of corruption, for which she spent 15 months in prison and was released on bail in May last year. All international observer missions have denied any significant irregularities in the process. And presidential candidate Pedro Castillo spoke to his supporters rallied in the capital Lima this Tuesday as the results continue to be counted. That for the sake of Peru, for the sake of democracy, for the sake of our country, to be respectful, not to sully the will of the Peruvian people. There are enough people to take off the head in this democratic party and the people According to the report of our officials, we already have the official count of the party where the people have won the match and therefore I also ask not to fall into provocation. And protesters took to the streets of Peru on Tuesday as the country awaits the result of the presidential elections. Progressive candidate Pedro Castillo has been leading the count since Monday, but the vote difference between his rival, conservative Keiko Fujimori, remains very small. Supporters of both Castillo and Fujimori rallied outside the National Office of Electoral Processes as the count continued. The allegations of fraud voiced by Fujimori's campaign team were echoed by her supporters, despite no strong evidence presented to support the claims. Meanwhile, Castillo's supporters urged the electoral authority to declare their candidate the winner. Police in anti-riot gear patrolled the areas where the groups were gathered. And in the votes of all Peruvians of Villa El Salvador, I was coordinator for night warning tables and it's those night tables Keiko Fujimori has won and the same for all Villa El Salvador and I'm here to defend the votes of all my neighbors. We are demanding that they declare him president already. The man has won in 19 provinces and the lady Keiko Fujimori has won in only 6 or 7 areas only. It's obvious they are cooking up fraud. In Bolivia, Attorney General Wilfredo Chavez reported on developments in the case of former de facto Interior Minister Arturo, Arturo Murillo, arrested in the United States on charge of money laundering and corruption. Muy bien. 
Chavez said the Bolivian government will do everything in its hands to recover the money stolen by Murillo, one of the darkest figures of Janine Añez's dictatorship. Go to the civil action that, as I say, seeks two objectives. The first is to recover all money from overpriced. The overpriced is already practically determined in the report that has been published now that is around $2.3 million. That money must be returned to Bolivians. The Ombudsman Office in Colombia reported that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights will evaluate more than 500 alleged human rights violations in the framework of the ongoing protests in the country, most of them at the hands of the security forces. Ombudsman Carlos Camargo stated that between April 28th and June the 3rd, a total of 417 complaints were received that account for 584 human rights violations. According to the official transcript of his statement before the international delegation, the most serious violations involved 58 cases of alleged homicide, of which 45 occur in the department of Valle del Cauca, where the capital, Cali, has been the epicenter of the nationwide protest. The Inter-American Commission, based in Washington and attached to the Organization of American States, is visiting Bogota and Cali, the city's hardest hit by the crisis. During the visit of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission to Colombia, groups of demonstrators took to the streets of Cali to voice their complaints regarding the human rights violations committed during the national strike mobilizations against the Iván Duque government. Protesters rallied outside the Hotel Torre de Cali, where the delegation of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights was hearing the complaints to demand justice for the victims of violence perpetrated by the state security forces during the national strike. Cali has been an epicenter of the mobilizations that began on April 28th, which have been met with fierce repression of peaceful protesters. One, let's say, it's very beautiful to see the Cali citizens speaking before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, because that all could not demonstrate. They can hear where they are receiving the statement. I have the opportunity this morning to give a statement with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights because I was attacked on many occasions by the police in my exercise of journalists. And here people are showing the real situation, abuse of power, abuse of force by the police during the national strike. That we wake up, that we understand that if we are united, if we do not continue resisting really, this is not going to change. That we really have to be aware of the importance of going out to protest say or not say it is peaceful. We have to go out and demonstrate because it's really the only way we have right now that the government is not listening. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. back to from the south. In Europe, several organizations rejected the draft resolution introduced by a group of European members of parliament accusing Cuba of violating human rights. Political forces, such as the party of the European left, rejected the maneuver against the revolutionary Caribbean island by the right wing in the European parliament. They pointed out that the economic, commercial and financial blockade applied by the Washington represents a true violation of human rights. The European Union should instead denounce the illegal and inhumane blockade suffered by the Cuban people for the last 62 years, the party said. Meanwhile, the European Union's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Joseph Borrell, clarified that the official position of the EU has always been opposed to the United States blockade of Cuba. The position of the European Union and its members, not only mine, is to be against the blockade of the United States in Cuba. I'm not saying this because I am dangerous Castroist. It is the official European Union position that is defended every year in the Security Council of the United Nations. Let's see if some of you learned this once and for all. And we stay on topic because on Tuesday, a group of lawmakers to the Russian state Duma, the lower house of the parliament, introduced a bill to request the United Nations General Assembly and the parliaments of its members' countries to condemn the United States blockade of Cuba. 
The document will be submitted for approval by the lower house on June 15. The Russian parliamentarians also call for the resumption of a constructive and mutually respectful dialogue between Washington and Havana. In addition, the lawmakers intend to call for a proposal to develop concrete measures and carry out practical actions to put an end to Washington's discriminatory policies against Cuba. They also demanded the immediate and unconditional cessation of any form of pressure and sanctions while calling for rapid normalization of relations between the two states. On Tuesday, the United Nations War Crimes Tribunal upheld a genocide conviction and a life sentence against former Bosnian Serb military commander Ratko Mladic. The former commander was convicted in 2017 on charges of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, including terrorizing the civilian population of the Bosnian capital Sarajevo during a 43-month siege and the killing of more than 8,000 Muslim men and boys in the eastern Bosnian town of Srebrenica in 1995. Mladic remained defiant throughout the proceedings since his arrest in Serbia in 2011, denying his participation in the crimes. A regular officer in the Yugoslav People's Army, he became commander of the Bosnian Serb military after the dismembering of socialist Yugoslavia. The court, presiding Judge Priska Matimba Nyambe, dissented from her peers in the judgment, considering most of the evidence presented by prosecutors as circumstantial. It's a historic day, not only for us mothers, but also for the whole Balkans, Europe and the world. Today they will pass the verdict into a butcher, the biggest one to be born after Hitler in the 20th century. This verdict is not the end. Us mothers will continue to struggle because there is a lot of perpetrators of genocide that are still free men, yet to be punished. The trial of four individuals suspected of being involved in the downing of the Malaysian Airlines flight over Ukraine in 2014 started in the Netherlands. The court is in a high security location near Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam due to the large number of Dutch victims from the incident. The trial started with hearings looking at the evidence and the investigation into the crash. Defense and prosecution will then litigate until July 9th. Relatives of the victims will be allowed to address the court at some point in September. Three Russian nationals and one Ukrainian citizen are being tried in absentia for the crime. The plane was en route from Amsterdam's airport to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and was shot down as it flew over eastern Ukraine. A missile downed the aircraft, but it is uncertain whether they came, it came from Donbass independence or Ukrainian forces. On Monday, a man driving a pickup truck slamming to and kill four members of a Muslim family in Canada's Ontario province in what authorities said was a premeditated attack motivated by hatred against Muslims. The 20-year-old suspect, arrested shortly after the attack, has been charged with four counts of third-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Several leaders of the Muslim community have called on the courts to classify the episode as an act of terrorism. The names of the victims were not released, but they include three generations of the same family, according to local authorities. A nine-year-old boy was also hospitalized following the attack and also recovering. The attack brought back painful memories of a Quebec City mosque mass shooting in January 2017 and a driving rampage in Toronto that killed 10 people in April 2018. This Tuesday, several major websites across the world crashed due to an outage on the global website hosting service Fastly. The issue appears to be related to problems at Fastly, the provider of infrastructure underpinning some of the central parts of the Internet. Specifically, it seems to be an issue with content delivery networks which host copies of web pages around the world, so what they can be delivered to users faster. Newspaper websites like The Guardian, Independent, New York Times and The Financial Times all vanished from the web early Tuesday morning before gradually reappearing again. Other websites affected including the online discussion platform Reddit, CNN and some Amazon sites. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us.
Welcome back. On Tuesday, a delegation of the Economic Community of West African States, the United Nations Mission in Mali, and other international delegates met the president of the new Malian transitional government, Asimi Goira, to mediate a transition towards elections in the country. The Economic Community of West African States has called for a new civilian prime minister to be nominated immediately and demanded for the formation to, of a new inclusive government. Goira was sworn in on Monday as president of the transitional government, solidifying his grip on power after carrying out his second coup in nine months. The inauguration ceremony in the capital, Bamako, came as Mali faces increasing isolation from the international community. The African Union has suspended Mali's memberships and France has temporarily suspended its joint military operations with the Malian military to exert pressure on Goira to step aside. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa put his health minister on special leave on Tuesday over a corruption scandal. Before Ramaphosa's statement, the minister apologized for the to the public rage over the allegations, the latest in a serious link to coronavirus-related tenders that have angered a public suffering pandemic-induced economic hardship. Mkize has denied any personal wrongdoing. South Africa's Minister of Tourism will step in as acting health minister, the president said. South Africa's special investigative unit is still probing the contract and hasn't released a report, although McKinsey's own health department has already described it as irregular. A student organization in Burkina Faso arranged a blood donation drive Tuesday in a show of solidarity with the victims of the last week's terrorist attack in Yaga province. Amadou Diko, president of Yaga-based student groups, said they took the initiative because they were born in the province and couldn't let such atrocity happen without us taking action. At least 120 students turned up to give blood at the National Blood Transfusion Center in the capital of the town. There are people wounded by gunshots, open fractures, pain medication is needed, and we are not talking about paracetamol, he said. At least 132 people died and many others were wounded after terrorists struck Seoul Han Village on Friday night, shooting people and burning down homes at the market. We had the idea to organize a blood donation drive today because we are born in Yanga province. This is where we came from. A drama like this cannot happen in Yanga without us taking action. They came in great numbers. They are really mobilized. We congratulate them a lot because thanks to them, we have got over 85 blood bags so far. The Syrian army repelled Israeli missiles launched from Lebanese airspace against several positions in the center and south of the Arab nation. On Tuesday, the anti-aircraft defenses shut down most of the Zionist missiles, and only material damages were reported. The Syrian government condemned the latest attacks and deplored the silence of the United Nations, as well as ratifying the legitimate right to defend the integrity and sovereignty of Syrian territory by all legitimate means. The Ministry of Defense denounced that these aggressions are part of the direct support offered to terrorist groups, in particular Daesh or the Islamic State, in order to once again destabilize the already liberated areas of the country. Palestinians in the Israeli-occupied and blockaded Gaza Strip are working to rebuild after the latest attacks by the Israeli regime, which left at least 6,000 people homeless, according to the United Nations Agency. The rubble of destroyed buildings is being collected to be recycled into concrete blocks to be used in the reconstruction of the Palestinian territory, as Gaza faces the limitations of the Israeli blockade, which prevents the impoverished strip from accessing construction materials. The latest Israeli bombardment ravaged over 250 buildings, compromising more than 1,000 homes, and also commercial units, authorities in Gaza said. The UN says it had released millions of dollars for the humanitarian response in other countries have pledged millions more in aid. But the Israeli regime is imposing more obstacles by insisting that any reconstruction aid be channeled through the West Bank-based Palestinian Authority, so none reaches the Palestinian resistance movement Hamas, which governs Gaza.
city now, as there are meetings being held in Egypt to sponsor this matter, and, at a later stage, the matter of importing construction materials will be clearer. We are now working hard on removing the rubble completely, so that these sites are ready for construction. We extract the steel and twist it and work on reshaping it, so people could use it again in construction if they do not have enough money. We extract the iron, reshape it and sell it again. The rubble is also sold to factories where it is turned into concrete and used in construction. And Iran is doubtful of the United States' willingness to return to the nuclear deal in the light of statements made by the U.S. Secretary of State regarding the maintenance of sanctions against the country. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif stated that he does not trust the will of the United States to return to the 2015 nuclear deal under the terms established and stressed that Washington continues with its policy of economic terrorism as a tool of pressure. Iran reported that it is not clear whether President Joe Biden and his Secretary of State will abandon the policies of maximum pressure that the Trump administration maintained. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said on Tuesday that even if Iran returns to compliance with the nuclear deal, hundreds of its country's sanctions against Iran will continue. Iran has insisted there will be no return to the deal without the lifting of sanctions. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.